Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ATI Second Quarter 2024 Results Conference Call. My name is Seb, and I'll be the operator for your call today. If you would like to ask a question during the Q&A session, you can do so by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. And if you would like to withdraw your question, please press star 2. I will now hand the floor over to David Weston, Vice President of Investor Relations, to begin the call. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, and welcome to ATI's second quarter 2024 earnings call. Today's discussion is being webcast online at atimaterials.com. Participating in today's call to share key points from our second quarter results are Kim Fields, President and CEO, and Don Newman, Executive Vice President and CFO. Before starting our prepared remarks, I would like to draw your attention to the supplemental presentation that accompanies this call. Those slides provide additional color and details on our results and outlook and can also be found on our website at atimaterials.com. After our prepared remarks, we'll open the line for questions. As a reminder, all forward-looking statements are subject to various assumptions and caveats. These are noted in the earnings release and in the accompanying presentation. Now, I'll turn the call over to Kim. Thanks, Dave. Good morning, everyone. Let's dive in. ATI's second quarter results represents another strong quarter of execution and performance. What excites me the most? Here are three key highlights. First, revenue growth. Quarterly sales reached their highest level in nearly a decade, nearly $1.1 billion reflecting 10% sequential increase in our strategic A&D and arrow-like revenue categories. Second, strategic mix expansion. A&D sales made up 62% of our revenues this quarter, putting us on track toward our A&D mix target of 65 plus percent. In total, 79% of our revenues comes from A&D and arrow-like markets, markets where our differentiation is most valued. And third, strong financial results. Adjusted EPS hit 60 cents at the high end of our guidance, and adjusted EBITDA came in at $183 million, exceeding the upper end of our guidance range. So what is driving these results? Let me break it down to three main points. First, it's about surging demand. At the Farnborough Air Show, the high demand for our products was clear. Interest has broadened beyond titanium to nickel, looking for commitments for the rest of this decade and into the 2030s. Customers are offering premiums for any available near-term slot that opens up. We're currently in discussions with multiple customers about investing their capital for added capacity. And why are they investing? To guarantee supplies available when they need it and secure their preferred position in line. They're increasingly facing the wide body ramp while still supporting historic levels of shop visits and spare parts demand. In late July, we announced new sales commitments surpassing $4 billion, primarily for high value nickel products for jet engines. These commitments not only support our 2025 and 2027 financial targets, but also add approximately $100 million per year in incremental annual revenue. Some of these commitments extend as far as 2040, reflecting our customers' long-term confidence in sustained jet engine demand and ATI as the supplier to help them succeed. Second, as one ATI team, we are executing and delivering. Our strategy is clearly paying off. In the second quarter, ATI's largest end market, jet engines, grew 13% sequentially to over $350 million, driven by specialty nickel. As the industry reaffirmed in its most recent quarterly reporting cycle, more growth will follow as the OEMs resolve their challenges and plan production increases through 2024 and beyond. Titanium revenue for airframe increased 11% sequentially this quarter to more than $210 million. That's another all-time high for ATI and a 28% increase over last year. Our expanded titanium melt capacity is a key factor in this success. Defense sales rose 5% sequentially, led by increased demand for exotic alloys and continued strong demand for titanium armor plates used in military ground vehicles. And here I'd like to take a second to recognize the specially rolled products team for the tremendous work they've done to earn that position. Their hard work is paying off. Specialty energy was up 37% versus the prior quarter. 
We see building demand for nuclear and gas turbines for increased electricity consumption. We expect sustained global demand in this end market for the foreseeable future. And third, we're well positioned for the future and more confident upside as possible. We are optimizing our operations to deep bottleneck flow paths, reduce costs, and drive productivity across our system from melt to ship. Our focus on increasing specialty nickel melt demonstrates the strength of our integrated one ATI approach. Since last year, we have significantly increased nickel throughput by improving turnaround times, optimizing melt blends, and implementing standard work. Materials flowing faster, and we expect to see the benefits of these actions towards the end of the year. It's great to see the experts from across the business units collaborating to optimize production output. These results represent a lot of hard work, and the team takes great pride in being able to work together to serve our customers' needs. Great job, team. We are seeing the impacts of this optimizing in both segments. In AANS, we achieved over 16% adjusted EBITDA margins in the second quarter, reflecting the success of the specially rolled products transformation. In HPMC, revenues grew 6% sequentially on level shipment volumes. What's that telling me? We're effectively capturing the impact of tougher product mix and equally important, price. Overall, we are well positioned now and for the future. And with that, I'll hand it over to Don. Thanks, Kim. What really strikes me about Q2 is seeing the benefits of our strategy, sustained demand, and operating improvements delivered to our bottom line. Kim shared some of the headlines related to Q2 financial results. I'll add some color and then walk you through our outlook. The first area of highlight is growth in our core aerospace and defense and aero-like end markets. Q2 revenue in those markets totaled 79% of our overall revenue, increasing 10% sequentially. Drilling in, our A&D sales were 62% in the quarter, putting us on track toward our A&D mix target of more than 65%. That's 13% sequential growth in jet engine and 28% year-over-year growth in airframe. Both segments contributed to the mix improvement and Q2 margin expansion. From the HPMC perspective, Q2 A and D sales were 85% of total segment revenue, continuing its upward movement. Jet Engine accounted for 59% of segment revenue. The A and S segment also saw a mix improvement in the second quarter, with 62% of total segment sales from A and D and aero-like markets. A&D sales, representing 39% of Q2 revenue, grew 19% sequentially, led by growth in defense and airframe. That's a record-level A&D mix for AANS. Aerolite grew 33% year-over-year and 8% sequentially. Metal movements may affect our revenue in a given period, but less so our bottom line thanks to de-risking pass-through mechanisms. We experienced that in Q2, which masked underlying growth. That created top-line growth headwinds in the quarter of 6% for overall ATI, 2% for HPMC, and 11% for AANS year-over-year. Overall adjusted EBITDA margin increased to 16.7%, largely unimproved mix. That's an increase of 220 basis points sequentially and 100 basis points from Q2 of 2023. Adjusted EBITDA margins in the HPMC segment were back above the 20% threshold due largely to mix and operational improvements. We have hired more than 500 hourly workers in the HPMC segment year to date. This is part of our strategy to de-bottleneck production and leverage our existing assets. Q2's margins of 20% reflect inefficiencies incurred while those new team members are being trained by our expert employees. We have also leveraged third-party staffing firms in the short term to accelerate production. That brings incremental cost. HPMC margins will become progressively better in the second half of the year, and production will increase as the new employees gain experience. 
AANS margins were 16.4% in the second quarter, reflecting strong A and D mix, largely through increased titanium sales. As expected, certain industrial markets remain stable in the second quarter. Cash generation continues to improve. Cash provided by operating activities is positive year to date. That's an improvement of $219 million over the first six months of 2023. It's also an improvement from our historical cash cycle. We are pleased with the positive free cash flow delivered in Q2 and our cash trending this year. We believe more opportunity lies ahead as we continue to lean out inventory cycles and improve production flows. With this improved cash generation comes stronger liquidity and reduced leverage. We closed the second quarter with almost $1 billion in total liquidity, including more than $425 million of cash on hand. Our net debt ratio decreased in the second quarter to 2.7 times, a trend that will continue with our increasing profitability and cash generation. Now, let's look ahead to the second half of the year. We're raising the midpoint of our full year guidance ranges for adjusted earnings per share and EBITDA while holding our free cash flow guidance range. We have strength and diversity in our jet engine base and enduring demand in defense and growing aero-like markets. We're expanding output and making progress on our ongoing debottlenecking efforts. This drives the meaningful growth we expect to see in the second half of the year. For the full year, We estimate adjusted EPS will be in the range of $2.40 to $2.60 per share. We estimate full year adjusted EBITDA will be in the range of $720 to $750 million. We are maintaining our full year estimated ranges for free cash flow in capital expenditures with free cash flow between $260 to $340 million and CapEx at $190 to $230 million. The midpoint of the free cash flow range represents an 82% year-over-year increase in this important metric. For the third quarter, we estimate adjusted EPS will be in the range of 63 to 69 cents per share and adjusted EBITDA between $189 and $199 million. The Q3 and full year guidance provide clear insight into how we view potential Q4 performance. We see Q4 as another robust quarter of sequential growth. Ongoing demand in core markets and increasing production levels support our view. We anticipate overall ATI adjusted EBITDA margins will increase sequentially from Q2 to Q3 and again from Q3 to Q4 to reach 17 to 18% by year end. On a segment level, HPMC margins will expand in the second half on A and D growth. AA and S margins will remain in the mid-teens for the balance of 2024. We remain confident in our near-term outlook and the longer-term growth, and the increased profitability reflected in our 2025 and 2027 targets. In terms of those 2025 and 2027 targets, Keep two things in mind. First, the recently announced $4.2 billion in new sales commitments include roughly $100 million in annual incremental revenue, along with related EBITDA. That $100 million was not reflected in our targets. Second, our backlog continues to grow, even with increased throughput and newly deployed capabilities reducing our lead times. Backlog reached $4.1 billion this quarter. Importantly, backlog in the second quarter is up 9% in HPMC, including a 14% increase in forgings. Our strategy and transformation are delivering the performance and value creation intended. That's driven by growth, expanding margins, robust cash generation, and disciplined capital deployment. Our trajectory remains on track for 2024 and beyond with a lot of upside to look forward to. On that note, I will turn the call back over to Kim. Thanks, Don. Our performance underscores our leadership in aerospace and defense where our differentiated materials are valued the most. 
Today's results reflect the power of our strategy and comes down to three things. One, strong demand for our specialty products, particularly nickel in addition to titanium. Two, disciplined execution, meeting and exceeding our customer commitments. And third, we're well positioned today and for the wide body ramp that's fast approaching. I'd like to close by recognizing the team's exceptional work. The results we reported today are possible thanks to their hard work. They're delivering every day, discovering what's possible. They're pushing, innovating, and challenging the status quo. And then they go back and do it again. Their commitment to always producing the highest quality products with a focus on our zero injury culture are the foundation of what we do. Thank you to every employee for your hard work and perseverance. We are indeed proven to perform. With that, let's open the line for your questions. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please press star one on your telephone keypad. If you'd like to withdraw your question, please press star two. Our first question comes from Seth Seifman at JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks very much and good morning. Um, morning, Seth. Morning. I wanted to uh, ask, uh, you know, morning. Um, you know, you guys uh, spoke about the ramp up in titanium, and it's clear that all of your new capacity is coming online. Uh, during during the quarter, though, you know, we heard about um, it, you know one of the seven eight seven suppliers uh, slowing down. Um, you know, we know there are some delays in terms of uh, availability of other parts made by other people, like interiors. Uh, you know, when we think about the the production ramp there. Um, you know, how, how do you think about the potential impact on your titanium ramp from other things going on in the wide body supply chain? So, Seth, uh, this this is Don. I'm going to take a, a shot at answering your question. Uh, first of all, in terms of what we've seen in our business tied to demand, you know, we do see some some uh, scattered pushouts when it comes to orders, but because of the broad based demand in our business. If a slot opens up, we typically have a customer that step in, steps in and says, hey, I want to take that slot. And um, that indicates a couple of things. Number one, we are continuing to see significant demand on our business from uh, an aerospace and defense standpoint, as well as uh, through other key markets like our, our aero-like. And you know, it also indicates that we've done, I think, a very good and purposeful job around diversifying our business that de-risks some of the, the items or some of the risks that you're talking about. You know, and, and what that looks like to us is we have diversified away from you know, being more single threaded dependent upon a particular uh, airframer, for example, or you know, now we're, we've got meaningful business with all of the major uh, engine manufacturers. So I think that's, that's supporting our uh, business quite well. It also gives us a lot of confidence when you think about our outlook, whether it's 2024, 2025, or 2027. So uh, that's something that uh, that I would share in regard to what we're seeing on a on a current basis. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, and, and then maybe just to follow up on on the engine side, uh, you know, you spoke about the new new business. Uh, that, that you um, announced at, at Farnborough. When we think about the growth rates on the engine side of the business, maybe if you could talk about kind of the progression there. Uh, I assume we'll start to see pickup from this kind of mid single digit uh, pace in, in the second half as, as that work kind of ramps up and and as um, you know new employees become more productive. But maybe if you talk about the you know the time frame and just the, the progression of uh, of improvement there over the course of um, of your planning period. Sure, happy to talk about that. So first of all, we are continuing to see some very, very strong engine jet engine signals, and it's uh, it wasn't just at Farnsboro, by the way. It uh, it's these are conversations that are happening with our our OEM customers on a regular basis. Farnsboro certainly reinforced it. As far as how we see uh, demand continuing to to uh, expand there, I think you know we've heard some pretty good and positive feedback or announcements rather from uh, folks like GE who, uh, you know, they made some pretty clear and strong statements around how they're going to run 
the the um, the supply chain and and meet the demand that they see coming toward them. Uh, that demand profile, by the way, is not unique to GE. We're seeing that uh, those signals of a very broad based engine demand across all of the major uh, engine manufacturers and. You know, there's a couple drivers to it. Uh, one driver that we all think about because we read the headlines from the airframers and think about build rates, that's a key driver. However, there is this thing called MRO, and that MRO demand is certainly driving uh, go- growth on the engine side of the business. So as we look at our positions um, and align that to what we're hearing from our customers, uh, we are we are seeing some um, sustained growth, and we're seeing uh, that's not just a 2024 and 2025 situation. Uh, you know, as the the build rates do ramp up, as I think we uh, we collectively expect them to, that's going to create another step change in demand. Um, in that regard, there's there's a couple of triggers that we monitor, and we think um, when they are when they are um, triggered going to create a step change in demand, whether it's for airframe, but uh, certainly for engine, those two triggers set are, are really related to, you know, the, the 777X certification and, uh, and then the FAA dropping the limitations on the 737 build rates. You know, when those two items are cleared off the deck, what we suspect is uh, the 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 good growth that we're expecting or, or under the current circumstances um, will potentially see a step change in a positive way. And so at that point, we'll be kind of reass- reassessing uh, how we think about the trajectory of our business and uh, see if we need to make some positive adjustments to that. Does that answer your Great. question? Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Yep. Very good. Thanks. Our next question is from Gautam Khanna from TD Cowan. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, guys. Good morning. I was wondering, do you guys have any um, fidelity on whether the products are shipping or being consumed and or used as opposed to inventoried? Because obviously one of the concerns that that we hear a lot about is um, the risk of a destock or a shallower ramp if, in fact, the aerospace uh, build rates don't uh, ramp according to plan. But I don't. Do you guys have visibility downstream as to as to you know are these par- are the mill products and the like that you're selling being actually used right now, consumed? Adam, I think, um, you know, as as, as you're uh, asking here, you know, we pretty, stay pretty closely aligned with our customers. And so we do have some insights to, you know, what is their true demand signals and what's happening with each part. Um, you know, forecasting and changing of backlogs is a very active process these days. Um, and as Don mentioned, we almost talk about that weekly with each of our customers. So we do have some insight into that. You know, and I would just emphasize, as, as Don said, we haven't seen any destocking or, um, you know, push outs. It's been more smoothing quarter to quarter. And I think to your specific question, we, you know, there's a couple very targeted areas, um, you know, with one air framer around maybe plate, titanium plate, that might be slightly um, in, over inventory that, frankly, as we look at our other markets, um, you know, both defense and our other, you know, aerospace, airframe customers, uh, those more than absorb any, you know, capacity. Although, to be honest with you, we have not seen any push outs. Um, I think there's a commitment to smoothing and maintaining the momentum in the supply chain by all the customers. So we're working pretty closely together. Um, so the other thing I'd mention, you know, just on the engine side is, you know, most of our products go directly into the hot section. And so, you know, you've heard from others in the last couple of weeks that there's really strong demand around MRO and shop visits. And so a lot of those products go into those MRO visits and, and are driving much higher in some cases 2x the MRO that we've seen in the past. 
And then if you layer on top of that, some of the challenges the GTF has had on, um, you know, accelerating their shop visits, we are, you know, a significant partner in that work with them and ramping up to meet that increased demand over the next several years as, as they work through um, those aircraft on ground. And I'd say lastly, I just want to touch on, you know, we did the announcement um, a couple weeks ago. We do continue to sign new contracts and gain share either through our competitors where they may not be performing to the level our customers are looking for or as customers look to diversify away from single source of uh, risk in their supply chain. So lots of moving parts in there, but we do stay pretty close. We, I'm not seeing high inventory levels um, in any one particular area. And we are, you know, we're pretty nimble as a company and we're adjusting as we need to, um, to respond to where the, the demand is and where things may be smoothing out. Thanks, I appreciate it, guys. Thanks, Kyle. Our next question is from Scott Deutschel from Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Don, sorry if I missed this, but can you give us an update on your assumptions for the non-A and D and medical markets in the second half here? Are you still expecting you know, those more cyclical industri industrial markets to trough out in the second half, or are you embedding any incremental conservatism there? Thanks. Sure. Um, now, when you just to be clear, uh, I'll talk about the, um, the air-like as well as the industrial, if you don't mind, because we, we spend a lot of time talking about aerospace and defense, as we should. It's our core. But I want to make sure that I touch on both so you have the benefit of both that thinking. In terms of uh, our aero-like, that would be medical specialty, energy, as well as electronics. We're expecting to see some uh, continued healthy, uh, broad-based growth on that side of the business in the second half. Uh, that's going to continue through 2025 and beyond. In terms of the industrial part of our, our portfolio, that's something that we've been continuing to reduce um, over time. It's part of our transformation. And as, as you know, we saw starting in the second half of last year, a pullback and a, certainly a softening around those end markets. And so uh, what uh, we saw in Q2 was really stabilization around those those end markets and um, and you know that's encouraging it's got to become stable before it starts to turn around and go the other way but as you think about what we've assumed in our second half guidance what we've assumed is being that we haven't started to see any meaningful uh, recovery in that uh, in those industrial end markets like oil and gas for example because we haven't started to see it we have not built in any significant growth in those parts of our portfolio for the second half. So the really strong growth that you're seeing in our in our guidance is really about aerospace and defense and aero like, and uh, and and so that's very encouraging because you're seeing that 80% of our business is really driving some some robust outcomes, some ro robust uh, top line and uh, and bottom line. Um, same thing would be true, by the way, if we drilled in a little bit and talked about our precision rolled strip uh, business in Asia. You know, sometimes we, we talk about that at the same time we talk in the, the general industrials. Uh, and uh, there, again, just like with the other industrial parts of our, our portfolio, we've seen it pretty stable, pretty flattish. And I think that's largely tied to the lethargic Chinese uh, economy. And our guys have done a really good job diversifying the sales mix with selling outside of China. But, you know, it's uh, the issue is, you know, that's not enough to really um, increase that, that performance of that business. And so it's, it's steady, generating probably around $250 million a year in revenue, and uh, it, it produces accretive margins, which are nice, but um, it's not part of our really our growth profile. Okay. Does that Thank answer you. your then, question? Yeah, that's great. And, Don, at the Investor Day, I think you said that no one else in the industry is taking more price than ATI is, and you know it's becoming very clear from the results of the other companies that they're taking – large amounts of price and are, they're seeing it in their numbers. Um, so I guess my question is, is it, is it still true that ATI is taking more price than them? And then if you are, why isn't that flowing through more, particularly at HPMC? Thank you. Well, 
Sure. Yeah. Well, let me let me answer it this way. What I would say is, first of all, we all understand it's it's tough to com- to compare one company to another company. You're talking every company has some overlap in our industry, but at the same time, there's there are differences, right? Differences in products that are offering offered, differences in end markets, uh, differences in customer base. And uh, that ultimately results in differences in, I believe, growth rates and, and uh, how the businesses perform in the short term. In the long term, it's a bit different. So to answer your specific question, we are absolutely getting price. And what I would say is we are getting our fair share of price. How does that, how do you see that? Well, uh, first of all, the specific areas that we know quite strongly that we're getting price are in things uh, like titanium. Uh, if you drill in and you look at the performance around our, our portfolio, our titanium portfolio, you would see that uh, that both on the HPMC side of the business as well as the A and S side of the business, our, port, our titanium offerings have seen meaningful increases in, uh, in price. And we believe that we are absolutely keeping pace with anybody out there when it comes to that. On the nickel side, nickel side uh, for HPMC, so think in terms of engine applications, for example, we know we have absolutely gotten price. Um, now, the price that we're getting is uh, there's something to keep in mind. We are a company that has a significant amount of LTAs. And so those LTAs can affect the timing of when you see those price increases hit your your financials. What do I mean by that? Well, even though we have a lot of LTAs um, and those LTAs can uh, can expire over very a various um, length of time, we've been very very active when there's an opportunity to sit down with the customer to to really address pricing even in existing LTAs, and so. Uh, we also do that, by the way, with renewals. And so what we know is that part of that price increase that we're getting is coming. It's coming in the form of when that that new contract begins, it might be in 25 in some cases, 26 in other cases, it comes with higher pricing. So that's on its way. And uh, and then, you know, beyond that, uh, transactionally, we're very confident that we're getting our sh- fair share of, uh, of pricing increases. Now that's on, you know, that's on the aerospace and defense, uh, that part of our core business. We're also getting our fair share and more of uh, of pricing in our aero-like end markets. Things like, you know, we sell Hafnium, and uh, and it's a fantastic product, has very unique characteristics, and we understand the value that we bring to our customers and medical and, and specialty energy and electronics. And we have seen significant opportunity for adding price uh, in that space. So we know we're getting it. It's not just about volume increases in this business. Uh, and, um, you know, we believe that we're, we strongly believe that we are getting our fair share across our portfolio. All very helpful. Thank you. All right. Our next question comes from Richard Safran at Seaport Research Partners. Please go ahead. Thanks, Kim, Don, Dave, good morning. So, um, good morning. I, I want to ask you a bit more about, good morning. So I, w- I want to ask you a bit more about this um, p- press release from Farnborough where you talk about share gains and solutions. Um, the solutions really mean forgings um, and also, um, so RTX said it was doubling or increasing. I forgot which. It's forging's capacity. Now you had a long-term agreement with Pratt. So is RTX's comments about increasing forging capacity really you? Uh, are they the ones, for example, that that are thinking about making um, investments to increase capacity at ATI? So I'll take this one, Richard. Um, so. You know, while we don't talk about any specific customer contracts or agreements, you know, I shared first quarter in the earnings call that we are a significant partner 
um, and in support and in supporting the GTF accelerated shop visits. Um, so we're working very closely with them to look across the full value chain and all of the assets and saying how do we you know work together to optimize all of the different assets that we have. And so you know I think I shared in the last call that our plan is to double our foraging um, output and participation next year. And so, you know, we are on a path to help support them and help accelerate that work. Uh, the other thing I'd mention, though, we've already been working with them on, and I, and I mentioned this again last quarter, to increase our machining output by 10 to 20 percent and our ultrasonic inspection um, capacity by 3x. And, and this is important not just for the GTF and, and the challenges there, but for the industry overall. We're seeing increased inspection um, protocols and, and testing that's being done to ensure the safety, which is good, but is a bottleneck in the industry and, and are continuing to, you know, to work with them so that we have excess capacity to help offset um, any kind of bottlenecks or any issues that may come. I do believe as we continue to work together and partner, we're, we have a very close relationship with them, that we're going to continue to find new opportunities to grow and, and work together and, and grow our participation. Um, as Just as a, an aside, the $4 billion announcement that we made on sales a couple weeks ago, about 20% of that, just to your earlier question, 20% of that is probably Forge Products, um, comes from Forge Products. Okay. Hopefully I can and answer both um, of those just questions. Just quickly, um, very helpful. And just quickly, Don, um, you took up your EBITDA guide, uh, roughly $10 million. You left your free cash flow guide intact. Uh, just wondering why they didn't go up as well. I was just wondering if there's, um, um, if that's just conservatism or uh, maybe you're thinking about you, got, you have some other working capital headwind in the second half. Thanks. Uh, you know, straight up, it's uh, I would call it conservatism. We tend to be conservative, you know, Rich, in, in general around our our guidance, uh, and you know, more even more so when we get uh, past the current period. And uh, but when you look at our, our that correlation between the EBITDA guide and and the free cash flow guide, you know, clearly the the EBITDA was rising. We had overperformance in Q2 that would we didn't want to ignore and send a negative message by not rolling that in to our our full year guidance. So that seemed quite clear. When it comes to our free cash flow, we do guide on an annualized basis, but we have some really positive data points. One positive data point is the cash performance year to date. When you look at our cash from operations, and it improving two, more than $200 million year over year, that is a really good fact. Another thing that we're seeing is a meaningful improvement in our inventory efficiency, which is really encouraging. So the fair question is, all oh, that's good news, Don. Why didn't, you, why didn't you tighten your free cash flow range or raise your free cash flow range? Uh, what I would say is the majority of our free cash flow is generated in Q4. And uh, some in Q3, but you know some in Q4. And so at this point, uh, do not interpret that we are we are um, softening in our belief of delivering, you know, something and certainly in the in the middle of that guidance range, uh, because you know that is absolutely the target that we have in mind. But we felt at this point, after getting halfway through the year, it would be you know the right thing at the moment. To, uh, uh, to keep that free cash flow range where it was. You know, keep in mind at, that, at the midpoint of that guidance, Rich, it's an 82% increase in year over year free cash flow. And so there are a lot of good things that the team is delivering to accomplish that, but it is a significant increase and, and we acknowledge that. Uh, again, Things are progressing really well. It's going the right direction where we need it to be to deliver, but that's just a, you know one data point on on the significant improvement that we're pursuing. And um, yeah, hopefully, does that does that uh, give you what you need? It 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 does as always. Thanks, Don. All right, buddy. Our next question is from David Strauss at Barclays. Please go ahead. 
Great. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Just wanted to ask about okay. wanted to ask about how far uh, how far the way we're through the titanium capacity expansion in terms of it manifesting itself actually in the in the numbers. Um, I know titanium was up a lot year over year, but that was a that was a really easy comp relative to last year. It looks like sequentially the last couple quarters, you know, titanium revenue has been in a relatively tight range. So just, you know, I I know the the new capacity is still to come, you know, that's still to come online. But in terms of the, you know, restarting the the, um, you know, the existing capacity, how much of that has actually manifested itself at this point? Uh, I'll take a I'll take a shot at answering that, and and uh, Kim may add something um, at the end. But so first of all, from a production standpoint, let me let me actually step back uh, for a second, David, just for other people's benefits. So um, we're we're increasing our our titanium melt capacity by 80 percent. There's two baskets. The first basket is 45 percent, and that's what what David's asking about. That 45 percent is tied to uh, to production off of existing assets. The second basket is something that's that's in process, on time, on budget, but doesn't really hit until 2025 and 2026. So let's focus on the first 45 percent. Uh, from a production standpoint. The, the, the restart of that facility that underpins most of the 45% has gone really, really well. It, uh, it has ramped really on schedule. It has, it, the cost to restart has been on budget. That was roughly $10 million. That facility should, at run rate, contribute between 10 and $15 million a quarter in EBITDA. That has been ramping. And so, you know, we don't expect to hit the full rent run rate related to the benefit of that 45% basket until we get into Q4 of this year. So, you know, when you look at the overall titanium revenue growth and performance, there's, you know, we do see where um, our, our volumes are increasing on titanium. We've seen very clear pick up on, on average price, which is, I think, an indication of capturing price and of mix. And we remain very confident that, uh, that our titanium capacity, it, which is largely under contract, is, uh, is going to contribute in the magnitudes that I described. And I think all I would add, um, David, to that is you know, as we've seen, um, depending on what flow path it goes, there is, you know, extended lead times or cycle times as things move through if they're going to a forged um, product part. You know, if you look at, you know, just slide um, four in the deck, you can see, you know, we are seeing the titanium flow through on the AA and S side, particularly around airframe. And you see, you see that growth starting to, to come through. On the HPMC side, those cycle times are a little bit longer um, as they work through SM, especially materials, or and then through forage products. And as we've been talking about, there's multiple, you know, that bottleneck moves around as we put more melt in. Melt is the first step. And then you've got, we've talked about the new press that's come online down in um, Monroe, um, as well as some of the new testing capabilities that we bring brought on to relieve and eliminate those bottlenecks. And so we're continuing to do that, as Don said. We anticipate to see on the HPMC side the impact of that in, in the fourth quarter, and, and that's progressing well. Okay, great. That's helpful. And, and just to follow up there, um, you know the the AANS margin, Don. Um, you know it sounds like you're you're assuming it's going to be you know relatively in line in the second half with the with Q2, which was really strong. But you know as I understand, a lot of the you know titanium upside will run through AANS, and then I believe it's margin accretive to AANS. So um, you know, kind of if you could just kind of walk through that and you're thinking around AANS margin in the second half. Yeah, I appreciate you asking that question because it's good uh, for us to clarify a bit. So, first, really strong margin performance uh, from AANS in the quarter, 16.4%. So, significant up 
uptick um, year over year and uh, sequentially. So how should you think about that 16 0.4% from a sustainment standpoint, right? So let's unpack it a little bit. So first of all, one of the, the, the benefits that helped to deliver that 16.4% was mix. Uh, the team has done an incredibly good job in shifting that business to more, more concentrated in the uh, aerospace and defense end market to the point where AANS A&D was um, was 38, uh, almost 39% of the the overall share of um, of AANS revenues. That grew at 19%. It was very healthy. Uh, you know, if you drill in a little bit on that, just for perspective, you know. So when you think about AANS, there's two business units. SRP specialty roll products is a uh, a large portion of AANS. This is a business we've been transforming and moving away from commodity products, moving away from selling through distributors and, and instead selling more and more through OEMs. That business, which a few years ago would have been mid-teens A&D exposure, we saw it hit over 40% this last quarter. Incredibly strong, going the right direction, and they're not done. They are going to continue to push that business toward value-add higher margin opportunities, so that's encouraging. But it doesn't actually answer your question. Obviously, you think about it in the near term. Well, one of the other things that's driving the Q2 uh, margins that is important to understand, we did include in my scripted portion of the call, it's also in the, the, the deck that, um, that you guys can, can see online. We noted that pass-through revenues did have an impact in our revenue year over year. It's much less sequentially, but certainly year over year. What, what am I talking about? Well, you know, we've, we've really reduced our sensitivity to metal impacts, especially to the bottom line through the transformation that we've been executing. But we do have pass-through mechanisms that de-risk our business. We like the mechanisms. They allow us to pass through um, changes in metal prices to our customers, but they can create some pretty wonky math year over year when you're looking at growth rates or you're looking at incremental margins, et cetera. So here, let me cut to the chase. So when you look at Q2, there was uh, about a $55 million reduction, year over year reduction in pass-through revenues. And that served to actually lift the Q2 EBITDA margins for AANS and to a lesser degree, the, the overall business. And so let me right size it. If you ran the math and said, okay, well, if I stripped out that part of that element of AANS performance, the 16.4% would go to about 15.9%. So that right there is a good way to think about where did AANS perform when you, when you kind of look through the uh, the pass throughs. Then, how should you think about it going forward? You know, I'll be honest. In my numbers, where where I project, I view AANS delivering something closer to 15% EBITDA margins in Q3, Q4. Uh, part of that has to do with you know we did have some really strong uh, strong mix in Q2. I think it's going to be challenging for the for the team to replicate some of those uh, some of those elements of the rich mix from Q2 uh, in the future quarter. So, you know, my thought is when I say mid teens, I'm actually saying, hey, I think around 15 percent. Does that help? Absolutely terrific color. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Andre Madrid from BTIG. Please go ahead. Good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I know you uh, called it out in the uh, in the remarks and a little bit in the Q&A, but I kind of wanted to parse it out a little bit further and just see how much MRO demand contributed to jet engine growth in the quarter and, and how much you kind of anticipate that to contribute moving forward. I'll take um, I'll take that question. So um, 
It's significant. You know, you've heard from all of our customers. They've talked about it in their earnings calls. There's a significant amount of MRO coming through. I'd say historically, you know, we've typically, we, we don't have, so let me start with this. We don't have full visibility of does it go into an MRO part or a new build engine. As I mentioned, our products and our forgings go into the hot section, um, the discs uh, in the engine, and they can be, you know, in either place. But, you know, we historically and estimate that MRO being, you know, 25%, and today it's closer to 40%, 50%, sometimes higher than that. And, you know, when, we, when I look at the demand and look at our order book, we are seeing increased demand across all of the engine OEMs for both the materials as well as the forgings um, as they continue to ramp um, the OE rates as well as, as keep pace with the shop visits. So I'd say it's a significant portion. It's hard for me to give you a precise number to that, but um, talking with our, our customers, it does seem like there is very heavy demand on, on both sides and more upside, if, frankly, if we could continue to increase the capacities and reduce the bottlenecks, as we've been talking about, there's more upside and, and more demand than, um, than we are currently put into our, our outlook and our, our forecast today. That's very helpful. Thank you. No, that, that's perfect color. And then it, I guess moving or pivoting to uh, the, uh, the electronic side of the business, I know Hafnium was kind of dampened in, you know, in the first half from the winter storm outage. But do you expect to make that up through the balance of the year, or is this kind of being pushed out? So the team's working very hard um, to to close that gap. Demand is overwhelming on the electronic side. Uh, I, I just bought a new appliance that has a chip in it that can tell me, you know, when the washing machine ends and so forth. You know, all of our, our Everything around us is getting smarter every day, and I will say that, you know, our business out in Oregon is one of very few, maybe one or two in the world, that can provide and, and produce the purity at scale needed for these electronic chip manufacturing. So, we are working. Um, we've got some investments that are ongoing right now. We anticipate to see those coming online as we come into the fourth quarter. And that's just phase one. We've got two, you know, phase two, phase three that we're also working on increasing our capacity and outputs of hafnium. The other thing I'd mention here with hafnium is um, in addition to electronics, it goes into several other really important industries for us. Um, one being the hypersonics industry and space industry. That is a really critical component that goes into a material that's used for very, very high temperature, think kind of second stage um, rockets um, from a space standpoint that, go, that maintain their strength at, at these very high temperatures. And so that's another pull on um, that's another pull on that hafnium supply that we're continuing to maintain. And again, we've been told by a couple customers that we're the only ones in the world that are able to make the, the quality and purity that withstand that type of application. So as I mentioned, we'll be, we're doing investments. One is ongoing today. We've got two more phases. All of those are contemplated and included in our CapEx guidance. Um, but we are, we're working very hard, and that team's working very hard out there to increase our, our output and capacities. Super helpful. Thank you. Our next question is from Phil Gibbs at KeyBank Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Hey, hey, thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Phil. Good morning. So the increase in headcount of 500, was that all in the quarter and what production locations were that uh, at specifically and do you expect more hiring? Uh, I'll take a, a stab at that, Phil. Um, so the 500 are all in the first half of the year. I'd say you can look across the two businesses and it's probably 60-40, you know, down Carolina, 60-40 up in Wisconsin. We are continuing to hire. As we've talked about, a lot of this is looking at our assets and, and saying, how can we increase the output and de-bottleneck some of these downstream activities? We've 
talked a lot about melt and melt capacity, but that's really just step one of this deep bottlenecking story. And we are looking at the assets that we have on, you know, in the, on the ground today since um, new capital takes two years minimum to get put in place. And we're saying, how do we increase the output and capacity here? So we are adding ships. We are adding crews. Um, in the case of Forge products, we talked about that ultrasonic capacity that we're expanding 3X. Those folks take about six months to get qualified to a level two or level three inspector that's required for the inspection um, protocols for the jet engine parts. So we are, we've been working very hard at that. This is the, probably the third year in a row that we've added, you know, we're anticipating a thousand or more employees, um, but we're getting really good throughput and productivity. You're hearing it from some of the other OEMs in the industry. You know, we talked a little bit about the GTF and things we're doing there. So we are seeing the benefits of that starting to come through, and that'll continue as we get into the back half of the year and we get up the learning curve. Don, do you want to add some color on that? I, I would like to. It might be helpful to just dimensionalize a little bit how to think about the cost, the incremental cost, and the inefficiencies that I had talked about uh, earlier in the call. So, you know, the, the, the investment in the additional heads is not new to us, right? We were doing that as we exited COVID, and we learned how to do it quite well. The learning, uh, you know, is setting up processes for our expert, current expert employees to, to, um, to uh, teach new employees uh, how to become excellent at uh, our production methodologies. But inefficiencies exist in a transitory way. So that 500 um, employees, that is a first half number, not specifically tied to uh, the second quarter, but how should you think about the dollar magnitude of the inefficiencies that we carried in that 20.2% margin for HPMC? Think in terms of probably between five and $10 million of inefficiency, um, higher costs in, uh, in the quarter. A fair question is, well, how long is that going to be with us, Don? And the way to probably think about it is, we would expect that, that those inefficiencies would largely be uh, behind us by Q4. And so our guidance contemplates these additional heads and the training and inefficiency costs related to it. Thank you. Uh, and just a follow up for me. Regarding your 2025 financial targets, are you maintaining that or are you increasing that this morning when considering the uh, the new air show uh, wins in, in the Nickel Alloy Arena? How would you uh, how would you kind of square that up? Thank you. So, so what I would say uh, is we're not officially changing our guide, but it would be a rational uh, thing to add. Uh, roughly $40 million to our prior guidance range. How do we get there? Uh, I know, Phil, you've already done the math. Uh, we said that $100 million uh, a year is the incremental revenue that we expect uh, will be added as a result of these new sales commitments, $100 million every year. And uh, these are richer margin products that are being encompassed. The nickel, the nickel mix here is quite strong. It's pointed toward jet engines. So we would expect higher than typical incremental margins. And I think a good placeholder to use is something in the 40% range, 100 million times 40%, 40 million of EBITDA. If you layered that on to the previous 2025 guidance range, which we guided at 800 to 900 million of EBITDA in 2025, I, I don't think that's an irrational thing for for you to do. Now, that's it's worth adding one more point to that, and it, that is there are a couple of data points or triggers that, that we do look for as we think about our 2025 and 2027 targets. We believe those targets, by the way, are generally conservative, but the two triggers are the the uh, 777X and and the um, the current FAA limits on 737 build rates. So 
when those two triggers uh, are pulled, I would expect that will it'll be another opportunity for us to assess our um, our our outlook targets and see if it's appropriate to adjust them. Uh, you know, at the latest, what I would say is those 2025 numbers we're going to be talking about uh, when we we talk about our Q4 performance and full year 2024 performance. Um, you know, but that again would be the latest. We would probably give a fresh look at those. Can I just squeeze one more in here, just on the the, the buyback? I don't know if it was talked about, but I, I think you you're effectively exhausted there, and a, I think your last comment was that it, it needed to uh, see some board uh, approval. You're obviously going to have pretty good free cash flow here for the next 18 months. Uh, where do we stand on that? That's that's my last one. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, I'll uh, take that one. So first, you know, we we're deploying. Uh, we have a very consistent capital deployment strategy, and that uh, includes returning capital to shareholders. We've completed the current program. To your point, uh, I don't want to get ahead of my board, but what I would point to is that we are expecting to generate a healthy amount of cash flow that's largely going to be in the fourth quarter. That's our cash uh, rhythm at the current current time. Uh, our board is pretty pretty supportive of returning capital to shareholders. Our bias has been toward um, share repurchases. So I don't think you've uh, it, I don't think you've seen the last share repurchase program in uh, in the ATI organization. So um, I'm sure the the board will take that up as a, as a topic in the coming quarters. Thank you. This now concludes the Q&A session. I'll hand the floor back to David Weston for closing remarks. Thank you for joining the call today. We appreciate your attention to ATI. With any follow-up uh, questions, please reach out to our investor relations team. With that, thank you.